I know a few good stories. They take place in a corner of America that might seem familiar, yet still manages to surprise. The settings are spectacular, the characters compelling, the action exciting, the plot lines unpredictable. I'm Tom Richardson. Join me as I explore New England's great outdoors, from Candlewood Lake, Connecticut to Caribou, Maine, from the beaches of Cape Cod to the peaks of New Hampshire's White Mountains. Stories are waiting. Let's live them on Explore New England. Explore New England is brought to you by your New England Ford dealers, Down East Magazine, the magazine of Maine, and Visit New England. When you include its west and south branches, the Penobscot is Maine's second longest river system, flowing for 264 miles from the heart of the north central Maine wilderness to Penobscot Bay. As it flows generally east and south, the river wears different faces, from a crashing Class 5 whitewater run to a gentle tidal estuary. In this episode, we'll explore three different sections of the Penobscot, starting with the west branch of the river a few miles below the Ripogenus Dam, where, in 2019, I enjoyed a fly fishing trip with celebrated guide Dan Legere. Dan is well known for his fishing prowess, and in 2015 he was honored by the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries with the Wilmot Wiggy Robinson Legendary Guide Award. He also happens to be one of the first people to employ the use of western-style drift boats on big Maine rivers, and we launched his 16-foot hide on a gorgeous July morning on the storied landlocked salmon pool known as the Big Eddy. Oh, yeah. A little bit better. One day my father put me out on a stream and uh, said, I'll meet you down at the next pool and with a fly rod with a royal coachman, I think it was. And uh, there was a hatch and there, every fish in the pool was going after my fly. And it was that day that I actually learned how to hook trout. And I caught a limit of trout right there. The reason why I, I moved to Greenville and the reason why I live here <clears throat> is because I can leave my house in downtown Greenville and in 15 minutes be on a wild trout pond all by myself. <clears throat> Within a uh, one hour radius of our shop in Greenville, there's over 40 trout ponds. And then that doesn't count the rivers and, and, uh, <clears throat> and all the lakes and everything else. It's just unbelievable. You're, we live in a little wilderness community. We call it wilderness <clears throat> community. It doesn't take you 10 minutes to be off by yourself, be on a dirt road and, and uh, find solitude. second one. <clears throat> yeah. I'm right about 50% of the time. I go, oh no, he took the first one and you keep bringing him in and you... All right. <laughs> that's a beauty right there. Very nice. Nice. You know, that's a... Yeah, you got it. You're good. Wow. Nice. All right. Hey, yeah, go. man. Nice. Thank you. Well, that was the fish we were looking for. That was the one. Yeah, well, maybe we can get a, maybe a bigger one? We'll keep trying. Okay. okay. I love it when a guide says that. It's amazing how quickly time passes when you're on the river, and before I knew it, it was time for lunch. One of the great pleasures of a full-day drift boat trip is the shore lunch ritual, and Dan had quite a meal in store. Well-fed and content, 
It was almost hard to leave our sunny spot amid the pines, but the salmon were calling, and so we returned to the river and the mission at hand. While salmon make up the majority of fish found in the Penobscot, the river is also home to brook trout, and Dan knew of a special spot where they could reliably be caught. This is a par. Not old enough to get colors. That helps. Oh, Yay! <laughs> Look at that. That is a beautiful fish. Thank you, fish. At around 4 o'clock, we pulled into our takeout spot on the side of the river, where Dan hauled his boat and, after dropping me off at the Big Eddy, headed south along the Golden Road toward his home in Greenville. The next stop on our Penobscot journey takes us to the river's midsection in the town of Lincoln, roughly 15 miles south of the confluence of the east and west branches. The river along this section is much slower, warmer, and shallower than the west branch and provides the perfect habitat for smallmouth bass. To see if I could catch a few, I enlisted the help of guide Zach Glidden, who launched his drift boat at a dirt ramp in North Lincoln. So I love fishing. Uh, I think it's just growing up in Maine. You know, that's what my father did. I mean, that's the time we spent with him, you know. Um, he worked, worked nights, and so we never saw him much, except for on the weekends, we always went fishing. And uh, I think that was the start of it from there. And it just, you know, went on throughout my life. And uh, it's a great hobby, it's a great pastime, great stress reliever. Uh, that's why I love fishing myself. John. Fish 
number two. Oh, nice fat one. That yeah, is. Fatty. Fish on. Yep. There we go. Nantucket sleigh ride. It's gonna jump. Nice. You're right, in this deep hole. The middle section of the Penobscot is loaded with prime smallmouth structure including submerged rocks, deep holes, shaded and undercut banks, overhanging tree limbs, weed beds, logs, and the mouths of feeder creeks. In short, you're likely to find fish almost anywhere. We uh, drifted through that long weed bed. Um, and now we're at the, at the end of this island here? Yeah, so we come down the weed bed to the tail end of the island. We got the water coming around. Hey, hey there he hey, is. Guess what? As if on cue. Oh, nice. God. <laughs> the little guy. So, yeah, so tell me, explain this spot yeah. that we anchored up here. So the tail end of the island, we got a bunch of ledge coming out from shore. The water coming around and then down off the weed flats. Get a nice deep hole here. Hold some nice fish. Yeah, how deep is it? We're probably looking at about 15 feet. So in a river that's only four to eight, 15 is a nice hole. Sure. <laughs> nice. So you know what? I'm telling you, he inhaled that thing again. He, he was right in that deep hole. He seemed to make it okay. After catching several fish on spin gear and soft plastic tube lures, I decided to see if these fish would take a fly. My pattern of choice? The venerable Sneaky Pete slider. The reaction was immediate. The smallmouth action we found on the Penobscot was phenomenal, and we took fish at will on both spin and fly gear all along the eight miles of river we drifted that morning. Perhaps more remarkable was that we only saw one other person the entire time. It was an eye-opening experience, and I vowed to return to this relatively untapped stretch of the Penobscot. Wow, Chloe, this is a magnificent sight on the river. Unbelievable. Uh, we were so lucky that the town of Old Town allowed us here and is happy to have us here on some of their public land. And it's in this beautiful copse of trees. And
The third leg of our Penobscot River exploration begins just north of Old Town, in the town of Milford. It was here, at the Costigan boat launch, that I met up with David Tannhauser and Chloe Chun, founders of the Penobscot River Paddling Trail, which extends from Medway, at the junction of the east and west branches of the river, to Penobscot Bay, a distance of some 100 miles. David and Chloe, along with the help of numerous volunteers and support from various landowners and other groups, have created a series of campsites along the river that the paddling public is free to use as they make their way downstream. It's an amazing resource and one that's still not widely known. We're gonna go down the Penobscot River five or six miles. We're gonna turn west onto the Stillwater branch of the Penobscot, go about a half mile and that's where our campsite is. Okay, and how far apart are the campsites spaced? We shoot for about every 10 miles. Okay, because that's like a typical, like, you know, a average paddler would do about 10 miles? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, really in a morning you can do 10 miles. Yeah, especially if you're going with the current. Right, right. That's <laughs> well, the only way we go. <laughs> After launching our canoe and kayak, we set off downstream toward Old Town. Along the way, we passed several small islands in the middle of the river, all property of the Penobscot Nation. Although inviting places to rest or enjoy lunch, these islands are off limits without special permission. Well, it's gorgeous. I can't believe we're out here and there's no other boats, no other paddlers, no other people. Right. It's really amazing. We sometimes see deer, we see a lot of eagles. Do you get eagles down on this stretch of the river? Oh yeah, I'm sure we'll see them. I'm thrilled to see all these beautiful native species growing here. Um, up there, the red berries of winterberry and they will be with us all winter even after the leaves fall off and then closer down we have meadow sweet it's a spirea after paddling south for roughly two miles we hung a right off the main river and entered a side channel shown on maps as the stillwater river but which is actually a branch of the penobscot that flows around orson island in old town A few hundred yards downstream, near a spot called Twin Islands, we spied the bright yellow sign marking the location of our home for the night. Wow, Chloe, this is a magnificent sight on the river. Unbelievable. Uh, we were so lucky that the town of Old Town allowed us here and is happy to have us here on some of their public land. And it's in this beautiful copse of trees and lots of flat places for tents. Boy, I'll tell you, they can't beat the view. <laughs> I mean, no, you sure can. Oh, Isn't it's really fantastic. It is, it's fantastic. And it's all, I can't believe it's like, you know, the public can just come here for, for free and yeah, it's great. that's right. <laughs> In this day and age, public it's access. like. Public access, <laughs> yeah. It's, we're very lucky that we mm. got to have it here. So here's your guest book, huh? Right. It's, a, it's I gotta say it's a little damp, but it is. Uh, so the entries are pretty recent. Two, they're all 2021, really. Right. Great fishing, they say. Good. <laughs> Good thing I brought my rod. Right. You better get out there. <laughs> I better get out there. <laughs> terrific fishing all along the Penobscot, especially for smallmouth bass, which were introduced in the early 1900s and have flourished. Uh, 
After spending a peaceful night on the river, David, Chloe, and I enjoyed a hearty breakfast and headed back to the main stem of the Penobscot. This is Indian Island, and we'll paddle here, and this is Orson Island, and that's smooth water, over here to the Old Town boat launch. Which we followed to our takeout spot just above the Milford Dam. The, the Penobscot River was deeply polluted for many years so that uh, people a little older than I am would say I would never go in the Penobscot, it stank. And um, over time the river's cleaned up, uh, two dams have been taken down, and it seemed like the time to have a river trail on the Penobscot. You know, it was the scene of so much in the past and it was really uh, polluted, as David said, with lots of lumbering and, and the river was so full of logs at times that the Penobscot Indians couldn't even get their canoes launched or back to shore. And so we weren't expecting such a wild and scenic river. Now eagles and osprey and great blue herons all along the way, lots of fish. The ratings of the water quality have been raised over time in the last 20 years because, because of the improving water quality. It's not fascinating about a moose really though you know I mean you just got to take one look at the gumpy looking buggers and you know the long legs the big nose the dangly thing from their neck what the heck's that all about anyways you know I mean to grow a set of antlers that big every summer and drop them off every fall I mean they're just an amazing animals you know they spend as much time in the water as a beaver or an otter you know that's where they go find their food you know a good portion of it at least so they're they're quite an amazing animal we've all made people this has been the first time they see a moose Hmm. Lived here their whole lives. Me, I don't like going a day without seeing one. That's why I live here. An <laughs> adult moose eats up to 70 pounds of vegetation a day. Wow. You know, and then they got a multi chamber stomach like a cow, so they spend half the day eating 70 pounds of vegetation. Then they got to go lay down somewhere, hang out somewhere, and burp it up and re eat it chew their cud like a cat cows do. Yeah, uh -huh. Moose in the native language means twig eater because about eight months of the year that's all they eat. Make sure you get a shot of that beaver because the beaver are the most important animals out here to these moose. Well, be beavers are the ones that make all these small dip ponds and build dams and you know create their own ecosystems out here. They're hugely important to these animals. As soon as you get out of this vehicle, you're just going to scare him. He's going to run away and you're going to cost him precious energy and time and that he needs to be feeding. And that's, you know, everyone's first instinct. Get out and see if you can get closer, get a better picture. And, you know, it's all you're doing is ruining that moose's day by doing that. Uh, okay. Uh. There he is right there. Every time I see a moose is like the first time I've ever seen a moose. I mean, I get out there and I, I had to keep buying different cameras with better steady shots in them because I got to take 45 pictures to get one because I'm shaking like a leaf every time I see one. 
It's just, it's just like a little kid in a candy store to me. You know, I'll never get tired of looking at them funny looking buggers. You really got to know your species. You got to know their behaviors. You've got to scout where to find them. Um, and then it just takes patience. And it's a lot of patience. If you, if you don't have that, you can't do it. I would say probably the most difficult birds to photograph that I find up here are the warblers. Um, just because they, they're so spread out and they're just constantly on the move and it's, it's a real challenge to photograph them but I love doing it just, be, just because it is a challenge and, but, and they're just like loons they're just really pretty birds it's a male magnolia warbler and he's always here in this spot every spring like clockwork Start in your own backyard, set up a feeding station, learn to watch the birds, watch their behaviors, watch for what makes a, a photo of a bird better than another one. Um, you know, learn to watch for body positions, things like that that make the photo look interesting. Yellow rump warbler, affectionately known as a butterbutt. <laughs> well, we got a warbler. That's good. I probably actually spent 10 to 12 years working for newspapers and just kind of burned out on it and, you know, gave up that line of work and said, well, what am I going to go do now? And, you know, I was always raised in the outdoors, you know, we always hunted and fished when I was a kid and I said, well, you know, going and doing nature and wildlife work you know, is, isn't that much of a leap for me. Um, I sort of had to relearn photography a lot because it's a completely different style, it's a lot, a lot you have to learn, um, you know, a lot of which, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, field techniques, how to approach species, things like that. Um, but it's, in some ways, it's not that far removed from working for newspapers because it's still somewhat documentary in its nature. So that's kind of how I got started, and that was in 2003. So I've been at this for nearly 20 years now. How would I describe the Rangeley area and its attractions? It's definitely the amount of outdoor activities that you could do up here. Mm -hmm. Snowmobiling, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, canoeing, kayaking, fishing, hunting, ATVing. You know, we, we got it all. Um, you know, and it, it's a great place to photograph too. It's one of my favorite places to go out and just explore around here with a camera because they know never what I'm going to find and I'm always finding new places. and. You know, there's so many miles of logging roads out there that stuff is accessible. <laughs> so you never run out, of, you, you, you don't see yourself ever getting bored of this area? You don't? No. You never run out of things to photograph? No, I'll, I'll never get bored of the Rangeley area and I can always find something to photograph somewhere.